the horror genre had gotten kind of boring. And, 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 and also, I love the genre, and I wanted to see something that gave me my tickets, money's worth. And, and I figured I was, you know, paying, I don't know what, two bucks a ticket, a dollar and a half a ticket, whatever. But, and I was getting about 10 cents worth of scare. What happened was true. <laughs> the most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. As the slasher film took over the 1980s, a new monster replaced vampires, werewolves, and witches as the new genre perpetrator. Mass psychosexual killers, randy teens, and generous helpings of gore and undress made the slasher subgenre a uniquely timely horror innovation. Contrary to Grindhouse splatter films, the slasher combines the gore of giallo films with the mystery of an Agatha Christie novel. Yes, John Carpenter's Halloween properly kicked off the subgenre, but its roots go further back. Many critics have pointed to Psycho and lesser seen Peep and Tom as the starting point for the slasher film. Both films introduce horror fans to the psychosexual killer that would frequent most slasher films. But the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the horror movie where more of the slasher elements would coalesce and take shape. While including an early version of the so-called Final Girl, it also cemented the role of the psychosexual killer in horror. While this specific element surfaces more in the later sequels, Leatherface took the slasher antagonist more closely in the direction of these future subgenre installments. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, and is not, a slasher film. Nevertheless, it certainly paved the way for what would follow. One day, during a frantic Christmas shopping season in Austin, Texas in 1972, director Toby Hooper had an epiphany. He stood in a crowded hardware section, weary of the holiday spirit and desperate for an exit. Noticing a bunch of chainsaws in an upright display, he fantasized about slicing and dicing his way through the consumer swarm. He repressed his dream of a yuletide bloodbath, but once he escaped the claustrophobic maw and settled back home, visions of chainsaws whirled in his head, setting off a chain reaction of story ideas. Not long later, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre arrived. In late 1974, the film was released to initially mixed reviews. In the near 50 years since its release, the picture is now rightfully recognized for what it is. One of, if not the, greatest horror movies of all time. Texas Chainsaw was a departure from the supernatural horror and monster movies that preceded it. I have waited a long time for this moment. And I too. <laughs> By the late 1960s and early 70s, horror was undergoing major changes. Interest in gothic horror from studios like Hammer Films was waning. Just one blow viral, and it must be here, or you will join the devil's souls. <laughs> the monster in Chainsaw wasn't an immortal vampire cursed by bloodlust, or a tormented soul forced to transform by the light of the full moon. Texas Chainsaw reinforced the idea that the monster could be a next door neighbor, or that innocent looking hitchhiker on the side of the road. The film perfectly captures some of the deepest anxieties and fears of American culture. It taps into our sense of guilt, the feeling that we're in over our heads and have no idea how to escape the nightmare of our own creation. When we're in the midst of a pandemic, catastrophic natural disasters, a climate hurtling towards the point of no return, a whole generation coming of age has never known a time without war and countless other calamities. This film speaks directly to our times. Right now, the feeling of karmic entropy that Texas Chainsaw captured so perfectly in the 70s is back with a vengeance. You've got nothing to worry about, you. You just take it easy, yeah? <laughs> 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 There are moments when we cannot believe that what is happening is really true. Pinch yourself and you may find out that it is. Even before it spawned sequels, remakes, and a thousand imitators, Hooper's original Texas Chainsaw was already three distinct films at once. 
the unexpected shocker evoked by the title and by the film's near instant notoriety, the masterwork of visual restraint coupled with unhinged tension that Hooper actually made, and the no-holds-barred gore fest that Hooper magically gets viewers to imagine that they have seen. While it did indeed provide a very rough blueprint for a soon-to-be burgeoning subgenre, Texas Chainsaw has less in common with the American slashers it's often associated with, and is more of a piece with apocalyptic horror of the time. Films like Wake and Fright, Mad Max, The Last Wave, The Long Weekend, Incident at Raven's Gate, and Picnic at Hanging Rock. Chainsaw tells a fairly simple tale at heart. A group of five teenagers driving through rural Texas happen upon a deranged, cannibalistic family. But there is, of course, a lot more going on here. Grave robbing in Texas is this hour's top news story. An informant led officers of the- Its foray into the hidden, darker side of the United States is apparent from the opening shot, in which the fruits of the grave digging noises that start the film are displayed in a grisly scene of two dead bodies mounted together on a large tombstone as mist drifts across the otherwise empty graveyard. The heavy yellow filter gives the scene a sense of desolation, creating an image of an apocalyptic wasteland. At least a dozen empty crypts. Yellow filter is used heavily for movies shot in the Middle East, Latin America, and Southeast Asia to play into American stereotypes of these countries as squalid, barren, and underdeveloped. In Texas Chainsaw, however, far off countries are not the ones that lack development. Under the veneer of civility, it is our society that has lost its humanity, and it is we who are destroying ourselves from the inside out. No suspects are in custody as the investigation at the scene continues. Much of the praise for the film comes from how authentic it feels, which shows in the grungy macabre detail of the sets and the naturalistically trashy use of lighting. All of the environments still lived in, allowing us to explore them with these relatively normal young road trippers traveling through Texas. It's an appropriately dingy aesthetic that feels like exploitative journalistic reporting of the time, showing off the destructive detail that lies at the heartland of an America gone crazy. The detail of the environment allows us to fill in the blanks when things become horrific terrific, yet oddly free of gore later on. It should go without saying that Texas Chainsaw's Leatherface is a top tier horror icon. Sure, compared to his colleagues, he isn't as colorful. I don't believe in you. I believe in you. He never uttered a memorable quote, some glorious cringe inducing one liner before dispatches some one dimensional teen. In fact, he never uttered a coherent sentence in any of his movies. He doesn't look as stoically cool as Michael Myers, standing there in the darkness with his white faced William Shatner mask. He doesn't have an impressive body count compared to the likes of Jason Voorhees. And that's all right. What's interesting about Leatherface is his innocence. He honestly just doesn't seem to know any better. He's clearly mentally handicapped and he noticeably isn't taking any glee in the fact that he's committing these horrific acts. This is a person under the spell of his deranged family. Leatherface is their loyal dog and all he wants to do is please his masters. Where are they showing? get away. Though this doesn't at all take away from his scary factor. On the contrary, it adds to it. You definitely don't want him chasing you. You don't want to hear his amped up chainsaw in the distance. You don't want him staring at your face while he's wearing it. Pam and her boyfriend, Kurt, are the first to fall foul of Leatherface when they discover his house while searching for their local swimming hole and decide to ask if they can borrow some gas. Now, let's put ourselves in this guy's shoes. Leatherface is hanging out in his domicile on a fine summer's day, and we know he's alone because his two brothers are out and about. Leatherface is someone who relies heavily on the guidance of his family, and so when he finds an intruder in his house when he's alone, he acts on instinct and smashes Kurt's head in with a hammer. Chances are because that's what he had in his hand at the time. The shot of Leatherface killing Kirk, pulling him inside, and shutting the metal door is designed to shock up as we question what we just saw. But it's also there to show the panic in Leatherface. He's not sure what's happening. 
and he wants to get rid of the problem in his house as quickly as possible. After killing a few more intruders, we see Leatherface dart into the window of the house, peeking out from behind the curtains and sitting with his head in his hands. He is visibly stressed and can't understand what's going on. In these scenes, he looks more like the victim of a home invasion rather than the bad guy. The only time we see Leatherface relax is when his family returns home with our final visitor, Sally, finally captured, and it seems like the situation is under control. Leatherface no longer needs to make the decisions and can default control of everything back to his kin. Again, one of the biggest mistakes in the horror genre is that this guy gets thrown in and is expected to be a slasher villain when he's really not. And he's only a piece of a bigger puzzle. In this film, he's not even really the muscle with which to do the killings. He just sort of happens to be there. And his role in the family is almost the stay-at-home mother kind. If Leatherface and his family are the villains of this tale, then it should be said that the film definitely has nothing even close to resembling a hero. It doesn't even have a protagonist in any meaningful way. Sally, while no doubt the main character, isn't exactly driving the plot forward. She does not make things happen in any significant way. Instead, things simply happen to her. She has the eminently relatable goal of not wanting to die, but if we're being honest, it's really more through a combination of luck, accident, and incompetence that she is able to survive the day. The film deliberately undermines something that we like to believe about ourselves, and which we like to see reflected in the stories we tell ourselves. In this case, it is the belief that, if not heroes, we are at the very least protagonists in control of our own lives. This film decidedly makes the opposite case, more or less saying that when it comes down to it, we are in charge of very little, which is inherently frightening. Sally's final escape anticipates a pattern for the soon-to-be slasher genre to follow. She breaks free of the family, runs screaming from the house, and rather than confront her pursuers, is rescued from Leatherface and his kin by two truck drivers, one of whom rams the crazier of the two with his 18-wheeler, and another of whom happens to be passing by and drives her away in the back of his pickup. In the end, Leatherface is left relatively intact in the road swinging his chainsaw. Here, the violence is indiscriminate. It erupts without warning. There is nothing to cling to, nobody to root for, and certainly no one we can realistically hope to reason with. Even the sight of sunflowers is enough to give you the chills. Inside their pretty clapboard house, the film's American monsters maintain a ghastly facade of nuclear respectability. They keep a pet hen in a canary cage, gather for formal family dinners, and make totemic folk art out of feathers, bones, and twine. But this home, crucially, is not tucked away in the forest. It sits on the main road where the trucks rumble by. Hooper shows us that evil is banal and that it hides in plain sight. It is simply waiting for someone to blunder in down the hall. In the years since Texas Chainsaw first hit theaters, there have been countless imitators, sequels, and reboots. Yet as loved and influential as the original classic has been, many who would seek to emulate its vision seem to overlook its true strengths. It's probably fair to say, at this point, we're never going to see a movie quite like this again. <laughs> 